Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you for joining us because we always like to talk about plants, insects, landscaping, and so that's what the show is going to be all about. And thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences. So. I will chat maybe about landscaping perennials and cut flowers, but there are three amazing minds right here next to me. No pressure. And let's find out what their expertise, who they are and their expertise. So I'm going to start first with Dr. Jim Appleby. Hi, Jim. Hi, Diane. Uh, I'm an entomologist in the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Su Studies at the University of Illinois. So I deal with insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. And I received a uh, email from Lois who says, I have voles in my orchard. How can I kill them? We notice they love living under snow piles and that's indeed what they do. They live under, under the snow sometimes and cause burrows. And this uh, photo that we show here, they're sort of a grayish uh, brown in color. They're about uh, five to six inches in length, have short ears, little eyes, and a very stubby tail but they can cause a tremendous amount of damage in the orchard. Several years ago, when I was visiting a Christmas tree nursery, I saw uh, that they had, oh, maybe about 10% of their Christmas trees that were dead. And these were uh, only about uh, four to five feet tall. Now, when you looked at them at a distance, you, you couldn't tell what was wrong. I mean, they, they were dead, obviously, but uh, there wasn't any noticeable damage. But then when we got down and looked at the base of the tree, uh, maybe about two inches below the soil line, that was all gnawed. So there was no bark, it was just like a beaver uh, attacked the uh, plants and of course they died. And the, the problem was that it was voles that were doing that. And so in the orchard they can do the same thing. Now for Lois' problem in the orchard, I would suggest that you uh, purchase Lois some of these uh, plastic tubes that you could put around the trunk of the tree and try to get those tubes down to maybe three inches below the soil surface. That would help a lot. And then another cultural practice would be to mow the area as short as you can possibly get it. Um, voles really like heavy, uh, a lot of thatch and a lot of uh, you know grasses that are three or four feet tall. I mean, that, they just love those kind of areas. Along our interstate highways, they love those areas there along the interstate that's all grass. And uh, so they can really be a problem. Um, you know, you could set out traps, but if you have an orchard, I, I don't think that's very practical. And then with traps, I don't like that because you can get other animals, you mm -hmm. know. Some people, if they have just a small garden, they put out peanut butter in the traps. Um, but you can get squirrels, you can get birds, and anything else. So they have to hide those, maybe cover the the trap area and really you need to use a rat trap rather than a mouse trap because these are pretty good sized animals. They're about six inches long and much bigger, stouter body than what the ordinary uh, mouse is. So it's a real problem sometimes and they have, you know, it fluctuates from year to year. Mm -hmm. Some years are very, very abundant and other years they're low in numbers. Uh, the one good thing I have to say about voles is one year and I've not had the problem before or since, they made tunnels through my Siberian iris. Yes. And, and left a, a dwarf magnolia alone. And it was great because Siberian iris is hard to divide. You, <laughs> but I could just, I just picked them up and divide them. That was the, and I had the voles to thank for it. But <laughs> well, there are some benefits. So that is the only, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, that was such a fluke. Yeah. Because it left the tree that I, you sure. know, it's kind of rare next to sure. it alone. But it was, you know, it had big patchy Maybe she should, should iris. plant iris in her orchard, huh? Maybe, you know, <laughs> away from the trunks. Away because, from the trunks. Well, this was three feet away, uh -huh. and it only bothered okay. the Siberian iris right. and not the tree. So anyway, thank you for that good discussion on what to do with voles in the orchard. All right, I'm going to throw it over to you, Paula Blakely, in the middle. Thank you. I'm Paula Blakely, and I'm the retail manager for Line IFS Farmtown. And I have a email from a person from August, so it's a little old. And now that we've had a little bit of cold weather, it's probably way out of date, but for next spring, we can still talk about it. Uh, she says, hi, I am a container gardener from Naperville. I have two zucchini plants that are producing only male flowers. Could this be 
the lack of bees. Thank you so much. Keep up the great show. Well, you have female flowers and you have the male flowers and the male flowers will drop off. And sometimes when, you, when the plants first start flowering, you'll get a flush of male flowers. And I'm not sure if that's to attract the beneficials, but the male flowers come off, they'll fall off. So you get a lot of phone calls and questions about, well, I don't have any fruit. And then as time goes on, your female flowers will come out, they will pollinate and you will have fruit. Now, if for some reason you have female flowers and you don't end up with a male flower and they don't pollinate, the female flower will still produce fruit, but it will abort and fall off. So those are some of the problems you can have. As far as the lack of bees being part of the problem, of the male flowers, I don't think one has anything to do with the other. The lack of bees might keep the pollination from happening so you wouldn't get fruit, but I don't think that's gonna control the flowers at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you just have to ha wait until both types of flowers set. Right, and hopefully and you've got the male and the female at the same time. Right. But so it's not. Really I know that in the spring do. or in the summer, you'll I'll get start getting phone calls about my pumpkins won't you know aren't right. going to fruit or, or you know. So it is somewhat environmental. I think so. And timing. Yes. So they get to you get to say wait and it'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait and give it a few more weeks, and then you can go out and cross pollinate them yourselves yeah. with a paintbrush. We love being able to say wait, although not <laughs> always do our viewers like that. Well, good. Thank you, Paula, because that will let people know for the future and it's always helpful. Okay, I'm gonna throw it to you next, David Robson. Thanks, Diane. I'm David Robson. I also work in the Department of Crop Sciences. I'm a pesticide safety and horticultural specialist. And years ago, an angel left one of these tools on my car, oh. um, but they didn't dent the car and it was in a <laughs> box, so that was a good thing. But uh, at this time of the year, this is when we start planting bulbs and Bulbs can be wonderful in the spring, but at the same time, they can be a real pain to plant if you are starting to plant hundreds and hundreds, just because you like those wonderful, massive drifts of the bulbs. The bulb auger makes your work easier. Uh, this is a good, thick, quality type. Uh, it has a shank right here that goes into your corded drill. You can't use a cordless drill except for maybe about four or five holes because after that point there's just no power. So you need a very long extension cord or cords, a good drill. You put this in, it's approximately 10 inches long from uh, this point here to the tip right here. We say most bulbs need to be planted six to eight inches. We can work that very, very quickly. If you have a good quality soil, it has some moisture in it, not rock hard, concrete hard, and at the same time, not really super wet. You dig the hole, go straight down. You got your daffodil bulbs. You can drop that straight in the hole. Make sure the point's up. If you can't tell on some of the bulbs, whether it's top or bottom laying, it's on the side definitely don't put it upside down and you just move on from your soil from one to one to one to one. Now this can also be used to plant things in the spring if you want to plant a lot of transplants very quickly. Again all you're doing is uh, digging probably about a three or four inch diameter hole. At the end of the season take it in, clean it, oil it nicely. I usually take a WD-40 on a rag and just put it on uh, and then store it away for the winter. I am noticing my shank right here is getting a little bit stripped and every now and then as I'm digging the bulbs and are trying to work it, it comes out. Mm -hmm. So I may be looking for another angel that might give me a newer one. I uh, see. But make sure that it's a good, high quality one. The ones that have the ex extra long shanks so you don't have to bend over tend to be a very poor quality and they start breaking after a while or bending. Again, this is a good, thick, heavy, solid bulb auger. Not that I know your angel, but this happens to be a power planter. Yes. And it's a local company, and they also offer it at Pledge Drive sometimes. So, so not that I know anything about this power planter. Not that you planter. know, but it's, it, it's been a wonderful gift for probably the last 10 years, and it's probably planted 
close to a thousand bulbs. And I will say, you're welcome. And I, I, I <laughs> we're so subtle. Yes. <laughs> okay. Very subtle. Uh, I have given them to students in my perennials class, and so that might be how I have to know. I was not about. one of your students. I'm not that young. No, but you were given one anyway because you, you like bulbs. So. And I liked you. Okay. Well, hey, everything's good. Well, say I have show and tell. I want to show the picture of when we we have, were my. W-I-L-L -L friends and I went to P. Allen Smith's home at Moss Mountain Farm and we had a great time. He's in the middle by the two ladies, the lady in the blue and the white, he's right in the middle. And we had a lovely time, even though it was 87 degrees in October. So um, great trip and we did that through W-I-L-L -L and enjoyed seeing all of his flowers as well as chickens and all his interiors. So that was great. Hi to everyone. Thanks for being such a good group. Now let's go to the um, little bit of a, an intro about the Did You Know? And we'll see what we have in store today. Giant pumpkins can be grown for competitions with some weighing over a thousand pounds. In 2010, the world record was 1,810 pounds. Okay, since I recorded that, they have another record. What I was think it? It's 2,100 and something this year. Yes. I mean, it was just gigantic. Huge. So you've got to make a commitment to want to do that, I think. Water. And lots of water, lots. a lot of fertilizer. And this was a good moisture year, yeah. so I could see why they and broke that record. And there's special type of seeds, too. Right. And you yes. don't get very, you don't need very many seeds. No. And I guess you let everything go into the one and you don't let the trailers yes. go. So. But I don't know that you're here to learn about competition pumpkins, but that would be the case. All right, let's go to the phone lines. We're going to start with Ann. She's on line one. Something about uh, the leaves on her plants. Hi, Ann. Hi. I'm bringing in my flower and tree mm -hmm. pots for the winter. Yes. And due to the heavy tree leaf fall, the pots and plants are full of falling leaves. Should I take the leaves out of the pots or leave them in for fertilizer? Thank you. Okay. All right. Anne's question about leaves just that, that have fallen into her pots. Probably not going to provide an awful lot of fertilizer. It will be organic matter breaking down. I'd be more concerned about bringing in some insects or insect eggs more than I would the leaves, but the leaves aren't going to hurt anything in the long run. They're going to have to shred. Uh, it's going to take the bacteria and microorganisms to break them down, but um, you know, she, she'll enjoy them, but they'll turn brown and mm -hmm. just be litter. And the next thing you know, cats will be pulling them out and playing with them. And <laughs> they'll be in your carpet and your places like that. I think I'd probably leave them outside, but they would compost provide, them. they would, compost is great. They're going to provide nutrients eventually. But maybe not This at year or this next moment. year or next year. Right. Holly, did you have anything else to add Oh, on I was it? just going to say I'd compost it. Anything yeah. you can throw in the bucket there, you know. And I, I tend to just, wherever I have it in the garden, I just kind of take the leaves out right where they are, yeah. let them compost there. Sometimes I'll mulch a pot, but I don't let it be just the leaves. So that was a good question because people are and need to be bringing pots in. So thank you for that, Ann. Let's go to maybe a follow-up on the vol answer of Dr. Applebee's with Sandra on line two. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Diane. We have voles all over every place. We have holes every place. Okay. <laughs> and in the lawn now, as well as all our gardens. And we did get scram for voles, and uh, we're not even sure if that works. And there's something, I wonder if there's something else. And also asking Jim, if this, what is there about this year that there's so many voles? Okay, Sandra, thank you. Good to hear from you. Well, I don't know exactly what the reason is that they're more abundant this year than other years, but, uh, you know, they do have cycles, and this is probably one of the times when they are very, very abundant. Um, for the average homeowner, I would say uh, maybe trapping is the best way to go. And again, try to reduce the amount of uh, turf that you have around the area. If you can cut the grass as short as you can, that will help. And then eliminate all brush in the area if, if that's possible. Is that possible? 
Oh, we, we may have lost her, oh, but, she may have but if you can, I know a lot of people mulch, so that could be where they, yeah, that, they mulch is great. That would help to increase the, you know, the brood. Uh, they have about uh, three to five litters a year. And, uh, is that right? Yeah, and so you can build up a population very, very quickly. Um, Are there any natural enemies? Oh, yes. Four-legged uh, creatures or two-legged? Oh, yes. Uh, coyotes and uh, foxes and red-tailed hawks and okay. owls are all natural predators. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, Dave, it's, it's really sad that uh, along our interstate highways, so many of our red-tailed hawks are killed on the highways because when they see a, a bull out in the grassy areas, they make a beeline right for it, and it could be a big truck or a car right in there. Oh. and they get killed. So I would encourage all of viewers, if you're driving on the interstates or even other highways, watch out for the hawks. And if you see one nearby, sort of give it a, a slowdown. have you had any luck with using repellents of, of any sort? You know, uh, most of the time they don't work very well. Uh, you know, I hate to recommend something like uh, decon, but I think it would work. Uh, but on the decon label, it says, and I think you probably know more about that than I do, Dave, that says uh, it can be harmful to wildlife. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if you're putting out decon in the holes and then a hawk comes by or an owl comes by and, and, and eats that bowl, it might not be very good for the hawk or owl. And so. definitely read and follow the directions on any label because if yeah. it does say not to use it, it's yeah. illegal if you go ahead and do that. So if you're okay. going to use traps like, a, and I would th really think you need a rat trap, not a mouse trap, uh, because the voles are pretty good sized animals. But I very, remember you saying how you target it and get it down into a run. Yeah, yeah. into a run. And then I would maybe cover it maybe with mm -hmm. a, a cardboard box or something and make a hole mm -hmm. in it so you know they can go back and forth. So it's directed. That, that, that's way you wouldn't get the hawks and the, and the squirrels coming in so mm -hmm. likely because uh, you will kill birds that way if you just let it out in the open. Right, so be careful. It's a real problem. But good question and good follow-up. Okay, now we're gonna to go to line one and Mike has a comment about the drill. Hi there, Mike. Hi. What's your um, comment or question? I think, uh, Dave said, you know, that when you use a pattern or a, a drill to plant bulbs, you need to use a corded drill. I just wanna tell him he might try the new uh, 24 volt lithium batteries by uh, DeWalt and Milwaukee, and uh, just see how long they last. You might be surprised. You might get a hundred or so bulbs planted without a cord. Hmm. And I guess, yeah. Mike, if you're still there, how much does one of those drills run? Well, they're not. Uh, they're not. They're not a cheap <laughs> drill. You're right. When they're, I heard those a, two, I drill and those those could be over a hundred dollars plus, but uh, it uh, might save you a lot of headaches of dragging a cord around your garden. Great. And the other hint would be to have a second battery pack you know so you've got one charged keep. absolutely yeah so Great. that's a that's a good comment because you need to keep getting the power to absolutely because when you are a bulb planting fanatic you, you, you know the fanatic folks want to have and when you're two. doing it you want to do it bing 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 yes. bing 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 you yeah. don't want to go here 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 yeah. wait yep well, great, thank you for that comment. Well, we're going to go back to our panelists and either, uh, I guess we'll start with you, Jim, either, and I try not to call you Pest of the Month, so well, I won't. You can call me Pest of the Month because I am a Pest of the Month. You can talk about a Pest of the Month. I'm Pest of the Day, really. <laughs> but you can talk about a Pest of the Month, okay, but well, you can start us off on the next go around. We did have another uh, email uh, from a person that said she had small black bugs that look like a speck of pepper and they have a vicious bite. Well, what she's seeing are, are an insect called the flower bug, and it's actually a true bug. And, and you, you mean know. flower as in F-L-O-W-E-R. W-E-R, yeah, okay. Yeah, not the other kind. And actually, uh, this photograph that we're uh, seeing here on the screen is actually my skin with one, oh, of, these wow. little, with one of these little bugs on it. They actually do uh, have a little bit of a bite. They actually don't uh, draw blood, but you can feel them bite. And uh, sometimes in the autumn months, it can be extremely numerous. It can have, you know, 50 or more of them on your skin. So um, what I would suggest is that, um, uh, that you use a uh, repellent, particularly uh, around the, uh, you know, a repellent spray on the cap. Like, like if you wear a baseball cap, mm -hmm. spray that on the underside of the lip type area and I don't like to put that stuff on my skin, but if you spray the hat itself, 
I think that would do a great deal. And somebody else said to use the um, uh, some of this stuff that you fluff up the your, 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 your when you put them in a dryer. What's that called? Oh, fabric oh softener the sheets. little fabric softener sheets. Put that under your hat and maybe let it hang down a little bit. That that odor would discourage it. Mm. And then of course, if possible, use a uh, long sleeve shirts or whatever that would help. Are those pirate uh, bugs the ones that are referred to as no seams? No, no, that's another that's insect. Oh, yeah, that's, oh, good. that's a midge. So that's, that's a, a no seam is a midge. Uh, yeah, that's a fly. So that this is different okay. than that. And this uh, is a true bug. This is a true bug. Okay. And uh, you know they overwinter as adults, and then in the spring they will lay their eggs in plant tissues and develop. And uh, actually, they're they're used in biological control because they feed on spider mites, on oh. many of the eggs of insects like the European corn borer, the eggs of that, the corn earworm, eggs of the corn earworm. So they're actually considered a beneficial insect. It's just in the fall months when the plants are starting to die, they get hungry. And they don't have those things That's to right. feed on. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jim. And now Paula, what have you got for us? A uh, reader says, I live in Northwest Indiana and a plant I cannot identify grows in my flower and vegetable beds every year for the past five years. Um, what we have found, what I research I found was that that's I think a nightshade plant. And I think it yeah. is from the Solanacea family. Nightshade is a weed, I'd say pull it. If you really wanna know what it is, you could bring it in and get a plant ID done. Um, but I'd say it's probably in the nightshade family and there's a large variety of those mm -hmm. plants. It's That a, sure looked like it to me. Mm -hmm. I think we're all nodding yeah. our heads. All right. yeah. um, Absolutely. But I'd say pull it, get rid of it, don't, don't compost the seeds. Yeah. And uh, you can spray it if you want to spray it with uh, some sort of chemical, you know, total kill. Uh, it is in the Solanacea family, which is also your potatoes, tomatoes, and peppers. So even though it is a, uh, the same family, it's not one you'd want to eat. No, it's poisonous. Huh? It's very yes. poisonous. Yeah. The berries are poisonous. Yeah, so be careful. Know what you're chewing on, <laughs> which I don't think they were <laughs> referring to that. No. <laughs> no, they just want to know what it was. Okay, good. Thanks for that ID. It helps to see those good pictures. Good pictures. Okay, Mr. Dave. Well, mine is a very simple uh, email question that actually came last May, but actually is appropriate now going into the winter and then next spring. And it basically says, my ivy is all brown and appears dead. What should I do? Well, there are a lot of different types of ivies that we get in the spring. We put it in the containers, we plant them in the ground. Depending on the winter, some of them may overwinter without much problem, but in other cases, they'll go through the winter and then uh, the winter ends up killing them. So first and foremost, when planting any type of ivies, make sure that the ones that you want in our environment or your environment are going to be winter hardy. That's extremely important. By the time you get a lot of the variegated ones, the ones that have yellow, the ones that have whites, the ones that have the very needle nose type of shapes, they're not always gonna be cold hardy. When it gets uh, with several inches to feet of snow and we get temperatures that are below zero degrees, most of them die out. If it does die out, just get rid of it. If it's in the ground, you can cut it off, you can remove it. Basically an ivy, once it's dead after about a year, loses all of its gripping power and you can pull them right off. I think if anybody is growing ivy and doing it as a ground cover, make sure that once a year, in order to make sure you keep generating new growth, set your mower high and then mow right over it if it's on the ground. Obviously, if it's on the building, you can't run your mower up that, but pruning it to stimulate new growth is the best bet. For those that are marginally hardy this winter, make sure there's a lot of moisture going into the ground. Take some of those leaves that Paula wanted to use for composting, mm -hmm. put them on top in a loose uh, amount, and then just keep your fingers crossed that we're gonna have a mild winter. Okay, very good. That sounds like that's thorough. All right, let's go to our mag quiz next. The cranberry, so popular in a sauce to go with the Thanksgiving turkey, is known botanically as what? A, needlium, B, injectium, C, vaccinium. C, vaccinium. The fruit of many species are eaten by humans, 
and some are of commercial importance, including the cranberry, blueberry, bilberry or whortleberry, lingonberry or cowberry, and huckleberry. Some of those answers are very creative. I only say them. I just don't, I don't make <laughs> them up. So that was, all those berries were a tongue twister. Well, we're going to see if we have a quick suggestion from Rita on line, oh wait, from, did line two go away? I think it was from Barbara on Voles. Oh, we wanted to have her quick suggestion, shucks. I don't think we have enough time to do a question, but I was ready for a quick comment, so never give up when you're on the phone lines. Well, I want to thank you folks for being on. We had a thank lot you. of seasonal good information that people need to use. So I just think um, it really helps when you send us in uh, good questions. You can see that at the end of the show. Be sure to send us some emails. And if you have any videos, you can send those as well, especially for identification. It helps to see pictures and video, and we'd be glad to answer those. Well, I want to thank you all for watching, and we hope that you have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.